with the support of Assis International and Stanford University. We are happy that you participate on today's session. Today is a repeat of a session that we had last week on consideration for triage. We encourage you to participate. Let the session be more interactive. And uh, our co-host or co-panelist, uh, Dr. Opa and Dr. Ndaba will be coming in at any time when you have any question. You can still drop your question in the uh, question box or communication box for it to be attended to. So this session, we're going to give you some housekeeping etiquette. Our programming is based on a foundation of love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than react if you disagree with something. It's everyone's responsibility to keep the webinar a safe space. We'll be using the chat function for question and answer on the bottom of your screen. Please send all questions to the chat box and feel free to introduce yourself. Please turn on your video, position your webcam effectively to show your face if alone or to capture the whole group. For any IT issues, send a message to chat to Echo IT. This session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. Thank you. We're going to discuss about a 57 year old man who presents with chills, weakness, and a dry cough. You're in casualty on duty and this patient comes to you. What would be the consideration for triage that you put in place when attending to this patient? So our practice change objectives for today's will be healthcare providers to follow reco uh, recommended PP guidelines. The healthcare providers should be trained to perfectly do the donning and doffing. Patients with potentially contagious infections should be isolated early. Screening method for SARS-CoV-2 should be put in place. Healthcare providers to recognize and diagnose hypoxemia on time. You have to use the pulse oximetry to appropriately triage hypoxic patients and prescribe non-invasive oxygen therapy using the most appropriate device available. As you've noticed, we are talking more of change practice than learning objective. The intention behind this uh, training or these sessions is to be able to talk, to change our daily practice. So throughout this session, we're going to learn about how to uh, do clinical examination when patients present to casualty or in the emergency room. Monica, please, could you click on the As we know, as clinician, when patient comes, the first thing to do is to go through and do a paramedical history. You get the history and you do a full examination. At this point, Dr. Op is gonna take us through on how to take a good medical history when it comes to COVID patients. What are the steps to emphasize on and what to leave behind? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Papito. So as soon as the patient presents to you in the clinical setting, the first step as you approach to examine the patient is to wear PPE 
we will go into that short in the next lesson. But personal protection and um, ensuring your own safety is very vital. In evaluating a patient who is before you with COVID-19 infection, the first thing that you're going to do is get a history and then perform a physical examination which is tailored and focused to COVID-19. Pertaining to our patient, he presents with vague symptoms which are not specific. So the first thing that you're going to get is a presenting complaint. Presenting complaint, and then you're also going to find out the duration and associated symptoms. So some of the non-specific symptoms that a patient with COVID-19 will have as with our patient could be myalgia, they could have feelings of fatigue, they could have fever, explore the symptoms, and then you are going to get the history of the presenting complaint. In this, you are going to explore the severity of this disease, of these symptoms, and then also any associated symptoms that they may have. Make sure that you are systemic, you are systematic, and you review the, sims, your, the systems in order so as not to miss out any point. For example, we know that COVID-19 will present in some patients with nausea, with diarrhea, or with vomiting. So when you are reviewing your GIT, you want to make sure that that history comes out. We know that COVID-19, apart from uh, presenting with GI symptoms and with non-specific symptoms, the predominant symptoms could be respiratory. So in your respiratory system, you want to make sure that any associated cough, any associated cough, any sore throat, any chest pain, any difficulties in breathing, that is also explored. We know that COVID-19 could also present with illness symptoms, such as headaches. So you want to note the absence or presence of this symptom. We know that COVID-19 also affects the hematological system and the renal system. So you want to go through each and every system and bring out the important negatives and important positives that the patient could have. So after your review of systems, you want to bring out uh, your past medical history of this patient. Does this patient have any comorbidities? Does this patient have any comorbidities? We know that this is going to give you, this is going to give us an insight of how to manage this patient. So conditions such as diabetes mellitus, conditions such as hypertension, immunosuppression, immunosuppression, all of these we want them to, all of these we want them to come out as it will help us to tailor, as it will help us to tailor the management of this patient. After the past medical history, you'd want to transition to the drug history of this patient. Is this patient on any medication? If they are, do find out the dosage of the medication, how often they're taking them. And if the patient has got any allergies, this is the perfect time to bring this out. Family history is very important. Gather some history. Are there, is there history of diabetes, cardiac history, any genetic conditions in the family? Social history plays a very vital part when you're managing COVID. We have talked about the respiratory nature of this patient. It will help you to decide whether the patient is fit for home isolation or home quarantine, if their living conditions are acceptable. I think um, in a nutshell, these are some of the pertinent history that you'll get from your, that you'll get from your patient. Remember to have a systematic approach to it and target your physical examination to tally with the symptoms and to tally with the symptoms that the patient presents with for you to have a conclusive differential diagnosis. Dr. Papicho, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. O, for that detailed comments on the uh, Thank you, Alana. Uh, I just want to announce to 
participants outside from this place that it's raining every year. It has just started raining every. Hopefully, it will not affect the quality of the session. Sorry for that. Um, the case updates that you decide to perform a essay and a physical exam. When interviewing the patient further about the issue of his present illness, you discover he has a four-day issue of chills, weakness, and dry cough. His wife is a nurse at the hospital and tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 three days ago. His wife has a pass oximetry at home and at the patient check his oxygen saturation. The reading was 89%. So his wife sent him to the emergency department. So here I would like to know if you're in the emergency department, what type of PPE will you be wearing there? Remember this is an infected a suspect patient, and you when we confirm, then it will be a confirmed case, but there are different type of PP that you have to wear. So after watching the video, um, Dr. Ndaba is gonna make some few comments on the type of PPEs and uh, what is the importance of wearing a PP when working in a triaging room. Um, Monica, please could you, like the video by box question. How to safely put on personal protective equipment, or more commonly called PPE. We will demonstrate one way to appropriately put on or don PPE. More than one donning method may be acceptable to your facility. It's important that you receive training, demonstrate competency, and practice your healthcare facility's donning procedure. First, Identify and gather the proper PPE to don, including an appropriately fitted isolation gown, a NIOSH-approved N95 filtering face piece respirator <coughs> for higher level respiratory protection, or if a respirator is not available, a face mask, a face shield or goggles, and a pair of disposable patient examination gloves. Perform hand hygiene by using alcohol-based hand sanitizer or washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Put on the isolation gown. Tie all ties or snap all snaps. You may need assistance from another healthcare provider. Put on the N95 respirator. When using a respirator with a nose piece, fit it to your nose using both hands. Do not bend or tent the respirator. Extend the respirator under your chin, protecting both your mouth and nose. Pull the top strap over your head, placing it on the crown. Then pull the bottom strap over your head, placing it at the base of your neck. Lastly, perform a user seal check. Do this by using your hands to cover the surface of the respirator and gently exhale, checking that the face piece bulges slightly. Then, while keeping your hands over the respirator, take in a quick, deep breath, checking that the face piece collapses slightly. If air escapes through the edges, readjust the fit of your respirator and perform another user seal check. 
Do this each time you put the respirator on. If a respirator is not available, put on a face mask. Extend the face mask under your chin, protecting both your mouth and nose. If the mask has loops, hook them around your ears. If it has ties, secure them at the base of your neck and crown of your head. Next, put on a face shield or goggles. Lastly, put on your gloves. <coughs> Pull the gloves down so that they cover the wrist of the gown. You are now ready to enter the patient's room. Oh, Dr. Papicho, I think you're on mute. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think thank you very much for the video. I'll now call up on Dr. Ndaba to make a comment on the uh, importance of wearing PPEs and to say if there's any difference between the PPEs and when is, is the ideal time to wear each of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Papicho, um, for this discussion so far. Yeah, so uh, PPEs or personal protective equipment are an important element um, in the infection prevention and control uh, measures. Yeah, so for us healthcare workers, uh, PPEs are an essential part of healthcare provision as we take care of these COVID um, patients. We want to prevent infection or infecting ourselves. So as you've seen from the video, um, you saw that some of the different types of personal protective equipment um, that you need to have will include uh, a face mask. And the face mask, you can have a simple surgical mask or the N95 mask. Okay, so in the triage setup, um, if you are able to get the N95 ma masks, that would be ideal. Uh, however, if those are not immediately available, even a simple mask would still suffice. You would need your gloves, yeah, because remember, our hands are our working tools. They touch a lot of things. So you need to make sure that you protect your hands by putting on gloves. You will need a gown um, to shield yourself from contamination. Um, you will need an additional face uh, protection, which may be achieved by the use of a face shield or goggles, if you have them. In addition to, to the above mentioned PPEs, you can have a cover hole um, that covers the whole body from the feet all the way up to the head. And additionally, if you may have boots, um, those can also help provide extra protection um, against uh, you contracting the infection. 
So PPEs are very, very important. In the setup of a triage, you will need to have at least the four minimum um, sets of PPEs, which include your face masks, your gloves, your gown, and your face shields. So you, you, the other most important thing is to make sure that you follow the appropriate steps in putting on the PPEs. So in addition to the PPEs, remember your hand hygiene becomes also very important. Okay, becomes very important. And so you may routinely need to wash your hands as well as have a sanitizer nearby if um, that is available as well. So PPEs are very important in prevention of infection among health workers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Adaba, for that detailed uh, comment. I would uh, ask or you our participants if they have any question or any concern, they can drop it in the uh, chat box. For those in the big hall, they can use the one of the laptop, the one facing toward the screen, for them to write their question, and then it will be answered as the session is taking place. Um, the next thing to talk about it will be how will you triage and isolate this patient? So please, Alana. Alana, could you click on the box? This patient was come to you and found in a very busy environment, usually our emergency room or casualty, they have other patients who are there, but because we've installed another way of scanning these patients, we have to know on how to triage them because they come in different uh, clinical presentation. So by triaging, you'll be able now to isolate the more sick to the patient who's just presenting mild or moderate. Uh, clinical presentation. Yeah. Dr. O, could you give us some comments on the, which patient should we consider more when doing the triage? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Papicho. When it comes to when it comes to triage, triage is the process of sorting out patients according to the condition or the illness or sickness of the patient. So you're sorting, out patients, you're sorting out patients in two groups. You're sorting out patients according to groups. So in general, I will go through some of the principles. I will go through some of the principles that you must employ when using a triage system. Ideally, during a pandemic of an infectious diseases, in disease such as COVID-19, the first thing that you want to do, the, your first element of triage is to make sure that the patients who are coming to the healthcare facility are patients who need urgent or emergent healthcare. healthcare. So patients who are coming for routine visits, who are coming in for elective surgery, as an example, these patients may be attended to via telemedicine. They can be checked up on remotely away from the facility. That is one. Number two, you want to make sure that services which are non-essential, you want to make sure that services which are non-essential, such as elective cases, can be put on hold or rescheduled up to the time when your facility can contain them. This will make sure that only patients who will benefit from the facilities or services which are being offered by your center come into the hospital. So one, when the patient, when your patient or client comes to the facility, you want to set up a triage at the gate of your facility, that could be one point, or immediately after. This could be by way of setting up a, this could be by way of setting up a tent 
just at the entry point of the facility. You want to make sure that there is one way flow or there is a unidirectional flow of patients with appropriate signage so that your patient knows which pathway they will follow as soon as they enter your facility. That is one. At the point of triage, you want to make sure that vital signs, that the first of all, the patient is screened for SARS-CoV-2, and then vital signs of the patient are taken so that patients uh, who are sick are attended to quicker than those who are still compensating. You also want to make sure that patients who are presenting to your facility with respiratory symptoms are isolated, or at least they're seen at separate stations from those who are coming in with other symptoms. This will prevent cross-contamination between patients. If possible, if your facility has an outbuilding, you want to make sure that this is where your patients are admitted. Once your patients are admitted or they are but their way is they're flowed and facilitated and facilitated to this outbuilding. You want to make sure that there's maximum distance from individual beds. So you want to make sure that patients are, are actually kept at a distance. If there is a waiting bench, you want to make sure that these waiting benches are also kept at a distance. If you're in an outbuilding and you've got patients with respiratory symptoms, you want to ensure that you've got good air ventilation in the, you want to make sure that there's good ventilation in this building. So good airflow becomes very important. So in the wake of COVID-19, you want to set up a separate waiting area for suspected cases and also a separate outbuilding where you will nurse these patients from. Also in the hospital, you want to make sure that the signage is very, um, is very clear for everyone. If possible, little arrows or little directions to guide both your healthcare staff and your patients becomes important. This, is, this becomes vital because the hospital is a potential area for actually amplifying the infection rate. If all of this triage and PPE, infection prevention measures, are not being um, adhered to, this could actually amplify the infection back into the back into the community. Papicho, unless you've got anything else to add, these are some of the tidbits that I can give to the establishment of a triage area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. O, for these uh, detailed comments and uh, telling us the need for triaging. Um, we we'll continue for our session. As Alana is sharing the screen for us. As we've been told before, these patients come in different uh, clinical presentation. It's not always a, a practical thing that they'll come all of them presenting same features. We always have to be in the lookout. One can come with one or two among the well-known clinical presentation. So we're gonna go through a few of them, whereas uh, Alana will show us the symptoms of SARS-CoV-2. We just enumerate them with a few comments. Some will come presenting with cough, Shortness of breath, difficulty in breathing, fever or chills. They can also come with a muscle pain, vomiting or diarrhea, and uh, new loss of taste and smell. So as you can see, you can group this uh, signs and symptoms into um, respiratory or digestive uh, complaints. There's also fever which sometimes it's not always present. And then loss of death can come after some few days. So it's better to have an idea about uh, this sign so that when they come, you can easily um, think of uh, testing and isolating them. Yeah. Thank you, Alana. So, 
Two now. Our practice change action will be to establish screening station outside the facilities. So if we don't have yet a screening room outside the facilities, we should bring it on board everyone who's involved in the management of the institution so that we think of establishing a screening room outside the facility for good isolation of these patients. And then you have to identify screening personnel who are well trained and well equipped. You should have a screening checklist put on the wall in the screening room so that nothing is left out. Screening everyone, even yourself as health workers, when you go to work, you have to be screened as well. You could be the one carrying the infection and then transmitting to others. Uh, you can still use some other application on your phone, like you have algorithm for triaging, which we're gonna see later on, they're available online. Everything that we are talking about here is available online. We'll be given a link to join and get registered so that you have free access to all the material. So I've installed some rules. You limit entrance point to facility, reduce number of visitors, triage high risk and symptomatic patient to area of isolation and provide hand washing supplies to ensure for face covering for those who are working in the screening room. Ensure waiting areas are well ventilated and seats are put apart from each other. Our case update for now. Okay. This patient denies fever, shortness of breath at rest, headache, loss of I mean loss of taste and loss of smell. He's talking in full sentences, but state. He becomes short of breath with moving and eating. He has been less active and is mostly staying in bed or on the couch. Remember what we said earlier when we're talking about the symptoms. Sometimes they might come with a presentation that is not typical for COVID. So we also have to look very carefully when attending to these patients. You ask your nurse to check again the vitals. They found that the heart rate is 95 beat per minute, the blood pressure 95 over 52 mercury, millimeter of mercury, respiratory rate of uh, 24 beat per minute, the saturation is 89%, and the temperature is 35.5 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please, Alana. When checking on your pulse oximeter, you realize that the patient is saturating low. So your concern is to say the patient is being hypoxic. We're gonna learn more about hypoxia. We'll first watch a short video for a few seconds, and then we'll have more comments from our co-panelists. Diagnosing and treating hypoxemia requires providers understand its definition and how to detect hypoxemia using pulse oximetry or arterial blood gas analysis. When we breathe, we pull air into our lungs. Room air contains 21% oxygen. When oxygen enters our lungs, it travels to the alveoli where it diffuses from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. Oxygen then either binds to hemoglobin within the red blood cells or diffuses into the plasma. This is called oxygenation. Insufficient oxygenation is called hypoxemia. The rate at which oxygen is delivered to the cells and tissues of the body is known as oxygen delivery inadequate delivery of oxygen to the cells 
tissues, and organs of the body is known as hypoxia. Every cell of the body requires oxygen for cellular metabolism. Lack of oxygen leads to cell death, tissue death, and organ dysfunction. The rate at which oxygen is removed from the blood and used by the cells and tissues is known Thank as... Thank you very much, Alana, for this video. We can ask to our participant to go online and watch the full video. For the interest of them, we might not be able to go up to the end. Dr. Ndaba, any comments about this patient who came hypoxic? What should be the fee and then what should they want to put into consideration? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Papicho. Um, so as has briefly been explained um, in the video, so hypoxemia um, in simple terms is a reduction in the concentration or percentage of oxygen in arterial blood. Whilst hypoxia is a reduction in the amount of oxygen available for tissue metabolism at tissue or cellular level. So the most important thing uh, to know about hypoxemia is that it's one of the common signs or effects of COVID-19 infection. So being one of the features of COVID-19, it is important that we understand how we can detect hypoxemia in patients who present with symptoms. So measurement of uh, oxygen in arterial blood can be done in two ways. The first um, method that we can use to detect hypoxemia is by the use of a pulse oximeter. I'm sure in the subsequent um, slides, we'll be able to discuss this in detail. So the pulse oximeter will detect the percentage of oxygen in arterial, in arterial blood. The other way of measuring um, or detecting hypoxemia is by the use of an invasive method uh, where you will have to draw blood from the artery and use an arterial blood gas machine to measure your, um, your oxygen concentration in arterial blood. But we understand that most facility may not have the privilege of um, having an arterial blood gas machine, which makes um, the pulse oximeters much more useful um, in detecting hypo hypoxemia. So a pulse oximeter is very helpful and will help you in diagnosing hypox hypoxemia and detect which patients will need oxygen. So it is important that as we are assessing our patients, one of the most important vital sign that we will have to measure is the oxygen saturation. And this can easily be done by use of a pulse oximeter, which will help you detect hypoxemia um, much, much easier. Thank you, Papucho. Picture your mute. We'll ask our participants to answer the question of bearing is the patient is hypoxemic or not, so that we get to go into a short discussion. Their answers will be reviewed in the next 30 seconds. Answer by yes or no. And we have a poll to see which one is the correct answer. Alana, after they answer the question, and then we go the up 
teacher to discuss the water. Okay. Answers are dropping in the chat box. The answers so far, three persons have answered. Mubiana said yes. Stanley and Joy, they've all answered to say yes, the patient is hypoxemic. That's the correct answer. Based on what we just ate comment from Dr. Tanda, but the description has given us when to call a patient hypoxemic. I think this patient. For sure, is really hypoxemic. Um, Alana, could you go on this slide just above this one? Just above? Yes, the picture here. Yeah. We thought it was also important to discuss different causes of hypoxia and hypoxemia. And this is a nice algorithm or table that can easily help you to remember different causes and origin of an hypoxic, hypoxemic patient. If you look at the causes of hypoxemia, it can either be from alveolar poor oxygen diffusion or poor oxygen binding or poor uh, DQ mismatching, ventilation perfusion matching. So when there's a DQ mismatch, you can check the alveolar arterial gradient and the, uh, which can be corrected with an administration of O2. What could be the cause when there's an increased AA gradient? It could never be in situation like COPD. For a shunt, which we all know what it is, basically the area that is uh, perfused but not ventilated, different cause can be. Uh, a reason why patients are hypoxemic, that could be pneumonia, atelectasis, ARDS, or pulmonary edema. And on the other side of the screen, if you check hypoxemia from alveolar origin, it's either hypoventilation or low FiO2. As we know, if you want to increase you have to play around with your FiO2. And by doing so, what could be the cause? It's either when patients, this is naturally for people who are doing uh, altitude uh, exercise or people stay up there. Physiologically, they can have low oxygen content if they live in high altitude. But for the other hypoventilation causes, you can have uh, CNS depression or muscle origin if you have neuromuscular disorders or a chest uh, wall disease, like flail chest in case of trauma or some deformities. Yeah. Quickly, Dr. Ndaba will just go through the hypoxia causes so that we move to the next slide. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Papicho. So again, um, hypoxemia, um, in my earlier discussion, is, is a reduction in the concentration or percentage of oxygen in arterial blood, whilst hypoxia is a reduction in percentage of oxygen at tissue level, which means that all causes of hypoxemia who uh, essentially cause hypoxia as well. So other causes of hypoxia, in addition to all the causes of hypoxemia, would be any reduction in the amount of hemoglobin in your blood, defined as anemia. So this to reduce the amount of hemoglobin available to transport oxygen to the tissues. So Ox tissue oxygen delivery 
will be reduced because you do not have sufficient uh, hemoglobin to um, transport your oxygen to the tissues. Remember, oxygen is mostly transported bound to hemoglobin in blood to the tissues. A smaller percentage is transported uh, in form of um, an amount dissolved in plasma. So the other causes other than hy uh, hypoxemia and anemia is ischemia, which is just a reduction in the amount of um, a reduction in tissue perfusion. Okay, the reduction in the amount of blood reaching your tissues. And this can be due to, for example, cardiac failure, when you have a reduction in cardiac output or in shock states. Any cause of shock will reduce the amount of tissue perfusion. That will reduce your amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues and that will cause hypoxia. The other causes will be histotoxic um, uh, causes. Under this one, you can have cyanide poisoning. Cyanide poisoning will reduce the amount of oxygen available for um, your tissue metabolism. Thank you, Papito. Thank you very much. There's a comment in the chat box to tell us that um, when patient is hypoxemic due to BQ mismatch, you can put them in pole position and then we improve their ventilation. As we know, pole position is one of the recommended position to put patients. You can either pull your patients um, awake or ventilated. Thank you very much, Anna, for that comment. Um, we can go back to our screen sharing. Alana, thank you. So, as we said earlier on, we can continue with interact interaction in the chat box. If you have any question or any concern, drop it please in the chat box and then it will be attended. Thank you, Alana. Um, so after talking about hypoxia and hypoxemia, our practice change action will be um, to download and print the oxygen word chart for use in the world. Also download the and print the life box triage tool, the post word chart and triage tool in patient uh, care areas should be always uh, available and easily accessible. Assign an equipment manager to process all contaminated and reusable items. Remember, there are so many things that we reuse. So always remember to clean them and prepare them for next patient who's coming. It can still be used by another patient who's not a COVID patient. So please always take care of a reinfection should not occur. So our case update, you recognize right away that uh, the patient is hypoxic. While you continue your interview and physical examination, you decide to administer oxygen therapy. You are training a nurse student and then he's very inquisitive, he would like to know more. He asks you a question, how much oxygen is being delivered to the patient? And why did you choose that oxygen device? So this is leading us to a discussion about oxygen delivery devices. Which one to start from and what, when to take decision of uh, going to a next step. I'm not sure if we all uh, we are all aware about the different devices that are used for oxygen delivery. But here the question is, based on what you have, which one do you choose first 
and when will you decide to change and go to the next or the highest oxygen delivery device? So to have more insight about the oxygen delivery devices, I will kindly ask Alana to click on the box. And Dr. Ob can take us through these uh, different items used for delivering oxygen and when to decide to move up. Okay, thank you. So, these are the gadgets that we're using to deliver of the oxygen, be it pipeline, be it cylinder, be it a concentrator. To the so, as, as I said, it's uh, raining here. There could be a delay in connectivity, but I guess now Dr. Op is there. Okay, yes. So the, the type of device that you choose, you choose will depend on a number of factors because all of these devices have different properties. The one we begin to be Okay. Oh. We're having a problem with connecting Dr. Op. I'll take it up as she's getting ready. Yeah, I think Dr. Hope, it's just she's connected, but uh, Dr. Hope, your voice is a bit faint. Is it possible for you to speak a little bit closer to the mic? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, that's better. That's better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So oxygen delivery devices are devices that are used to give oxygen from the oxygen source itself up to the patient. We know that you escalate care depending on the properties of the ladder. The first type of device that we use are the nasal prongs, commonly called nasal catheters and, or nasal cannula. So these may be used on adults or children. You titrate the florets, you start at a floret of one, and you can use them up to florets of six liters per minute. At these florets, these devices can give you a fraction of inspired oxygen. So that is improving oxygenation from your 20, 21% in room air up to a fraction of 40% at a maximum of six liters per minute. After the patient has been put on this type of oxygen delivery device, the next step that you will do is to assess whether your device is working or not. This can be by looking at the clinical signs that the patient has before you. So you want to check the saturation. Is your oxygen moving? How is your respiratory rate? Is it coming down? Is the laboring that the patient was exhibiting minimizing? How is the quality of the respirations? These are some of the clinical parameters which will help you to assess how effective your device is. Remember to give them a little bit of time to equilibrate and st stabilize on that particular device before escalating. The next device that is available is the, na the nasal pharyngeal catheter is used in infants and in children. So it is inserted in the nose and it goes all the way up to the nasal pharynx. In terms of the flow rate, this is usually a low flow rate, one to two liters per minute, and you expect the fraction of inspired oxygen to increase from 45% up to 60%. Using the same, using the same clinical principle to a break, you assess its effectiveness. If you are not happy with your computers, you want to escalate the oxygen delivery devices. Alana, can you just move, or can you please move downwards on the slide? So after the catheters, after the cannulas that we used above, come to your face masks. Face masks are very different. We've got a simple face mask, which don't have those. We've got a Mask. We've got our non rebreather face mask. So here I will discuss the simple face mask. These can be used in adults and in children. The florets that you're using here are higher florets. So you may dial up 
from six liters up to 10 liters per minute. The expected fraction of oxygen that is to be given will increase from 44 to 60%. So what you can see is that you're escalating the amount of oxygen which is being delivered to the patient. So that your cannula, your nasal cannula, your nasopharyngeal cannula, and your face mask, these are low flow oxygen delivery devices. If your patient is not improving clinically, you want to escalate your care and you use a face mask, which has a reservoir bag. This is commonly called a non-rebreather bag or NRB. So the NRB equally is divided into two types. You've got your partial non-rebreather mask, which has a bag, or you've got your complete bag. I would talk about it. So your mask with a reservoir bag, you can use it in an adult or in a child. You can dial up your flow rates from 10 to 15 liters per minute. On this mask, the fraction of inspired oxygen that is given will vary from as much as 60% all the way to 95%. So that is the advantage that this type of mask has. Alana, can you please scroll down? That did mention that we had a device called a Venturi face mask. Participants, if you look at the picture, which is on your left-hand side, you can see a little color-coded adapter, which is there in the picture. So the Venturi device comes in in two types. You've got your fixed Venturi, such as the one which is in the picture on your left. When you look at the Venturi device, each one is very particular. It will tell you the fraction of oxygen that it gives at a particular flow rate. For instance, the pink one, as an example in the picture, it can give you a fraction of inspired oxygen of 40 or 40 percent so you have to be careful as you decide to as you decide on which type of venturi that you're going to use the other type of venturi is a single venturi device but you can adjust it you can adjust the flow rates that it gives and consequently the fio2 which is the fraction of inspired oxygen will either increase or decrease depending on how much, depending on how much is. For Venturi, the oxygen flow rate and the FiO2 is device specific. In general, Venturis will be used from a flow rate of four liters all the way up to 15 liters per minute. And the expected FiO2 will be from 24% all the way up to 60%, depending on the device which is used. Alana, can you scroll down? Okay, I think um, I think that is the last oxygen delivery which we us in the session. Thank you, Papicho. Thank you, Doctor Op. Um, I have a question that I would ask you. Maybe you can give more comment on it. The real situation is that uh, in most hospitals in remote areas, they might not have different uh, delivery device to escalate from lower to, to the eyes. Maybe you can just share some more light on the principle, just in summary, the principle behind that is there when you're doing the escalation oxygen therapy. Just very short, since it's really important okay. for us to understand the importance of escalation in COVID patients. Okay, Papich, thank you so much. So what happens is that you may be practicing in a facility whereby your oxygen, the, the repertoire of oxygen delivery devices is limited. So one, you want to start from a device which to improve the least flow rates. This will first of all ensure that there is little wastage. So most of the facilities are equipped with nasal cannula. You have to remember the spectrum or the flow rates at which each device will use. So you may start from your nasal cannula and then you escalate upwards according to the device that you have. Remember, the whole essence of this escalation is to deliver higher quantities or in training, higher quantities of oxygen 
to be limited as to the amounts of or the types of devices which you have, you may want to refer your patient to the next available center. That is one thing that you could do as hypoxemia is a very life-threatening condition in patients with COVID pneumonia or COVID ARDS. So that is one tidbit which I would want to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will still remind our participant that the material is uh, free. All we ask you is to go online. The link will be shared after the session. You go free online and then you click on the link, you register and at your own free time, you'll be getting access to everything that is being presented here in the next future sessions. We proceed with our class and then we have very limited equipment. Are there guidelines for using disposable equipment? Let me see further about this question by clicking on the box, please. As we know, most of these devices that we've from talking about, they are meant to be for single use. But for many reasons that we may not be able to stipulate here, we end up by reusing them from one patient to another one. But remember, when using the same device from one to another, you can do cause infection. You can also infect people, patients who are not uh, COVID or any other uh, bacterial infection can still be transmitted by reusing if not properly sterilized. To talk about IPC, I'll ask uh, Dr. Ndaba to make a bit more comment on sterilization of different devices that we use. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Papicho. Um, as you have clearly mentioned, um, different uh, devices will have different um, indications as to whether it's a single use or it can be sterilized or disinfected. And the guidelines for treating a particular device should be followed. Um, uh, according to the device that is um, being used. So for most of the oxygen delivery systems, um, these we generally uh, reuse. This is equipment that we will reuse from one patient to the other. But like Dr. Papicho has mentioned, it is important that we bear in mind that we try and prevent cross infection. And in the era of COVID, that becomes very important. So there are different ways of sterilizing uh, equipment um, and instructions have to be followed according to each specific equipment that you are dealing with. For some equipment, you can do uh, chemical disinfection where you use different available solutions for disinfection that equipment and you need to follow the different guidelines. For other equipment, you will need to um, use hot water disinfection where you expose that particular device to a particular heated temperature of that particular liquid or water in order to kill the um, bacteria or viruses or whatever organ microorganisms that might be that might be uh, present so it is important that we take time to actually clean and disinfect the devices that we use between patients to avoid um, uh, cross 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 infection remember um, for covid transmission we talk about aerosol generation 
um, from the airway, droplet um, spread from the airway. So most of the airway devices become um, equipment that will have um, a high chance of harboring the viruses. And so we need to take time and disinfect these equipment in order to prevent um, infection uh, transmission. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. And uh, as we are going back to the sharing screen, I would like also to make comment to say um, there's a link that has been shared where full uh, details on how to sterilize this equipment is being given as per standard recommendation from WHO. So we can still go the link, we print it, and then we share with our colleagues who are not with us during this session so that uh, even if we are not on duty, correct practice is being done at your working stations. Your students ask a question to know what is the source of oxygen. There are different sources of oxygen, but in the uh, reason of time, we'll not be able to discuss them in here. We can keep this session or keep this discussion for the next session to come. As at for now, we will go to our review practice change and uh, make some good recommendation. So healthcare providers should follow recommended PP guidelines and uh, we, should train, we should be trained in a proper donning and doffing and to avoid contamination. Isolate patients with potential infection, develop screening method for COVID-19 and recognize, I mean, recognize and recognize hypoxemia using a pulse oximeter. Use pulse oximeter for appropriate triage of patients and prescribe oxygen therapy using the most appropriate device available at your institution. On the same link that will be shared, you can find the, the Lifebox triaging tool, which we urge you to go to and print it out. You stick it in your room and you'll be using it for triaging your patients who are hypoxic or who come to your emergency room. Um, before we wrap it up, I don't know if uh, Dr. Ob or Dr. Ndaba has any comments to bring up. Dr. Ndaba? Oh, yeah, please, Ob, come in, please. Okay, for me, my only contribution is that when you're attending to a patient with COVID-19 infection, step number one is your personal protection. Is your person the right type of PPE according to the risk which is before you? Secondly, we know that hypoxemia or hypoxia is a major issue with patients with uh, COVID infection. So you want to make sure that you monitor their saturations adequately use your clinical signs, and then choose the right device so as to optimize that patient and prevent deterioration. That is my key learning point for today. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Op, Dr. Ndaba. In addition to what Dr. Piri has said, um, remember infection prevention is key. And when we talk about the different devices that we use, to attend to these patients, the airway devices, they need to be disinfected routinely so that we avoid cross, cross infection and infection between patients. So we need to follow appropriate disinfection guidelines as well as making sure that eh, before we use each particular device on the next patient, that device is in good condition. Thank you, Papicho. Thank you very much. I like the comments from Anna. She says 
She has never contracted COVID-19 because of consistent use of PPE. Do not compromise your own health. Even when doing the simple procedure that you think may not expose you, remember to put your PPE because contamination risk is very high. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, Alana, please, up a bit, thank you. So the key topics to review, I think my two colleagues have mentioned them. Um, I can just go to some few points. The use of pass oximetry as a triaging tool. Always make sure that in your emergency room, you have a pass oximeter. Some of these patients with COVID too, they might come very hypoxic, but smiling or talking as this patient with from talking about here. He may use hypoxic, but you're able to walk and talk properly, not showing so much difficulties in breathing. And uh, non-invasive there's a there's a mark that has come on top of the screen. Sorry for this. Alan, is it from you? I'm going to delete all my kings. Okay, fine. We can continue. Yeah. Um, and click on OK, that white box will go away. Yeah, just click OK. Trends getting bigger. It's fine. Thank you. Um, so just to emphasize again on the need of wearing a, P, um, a PPE and the, to play on the um, triaging protocols, have them printed and stick in the emergency room so that everyone can access them. For now, I think we are ending our session for today. I'll hand over to Alana to make any announcements. Before I do that, I will kindly ask you to go online when we share the link, you register for easy access to the material. And I wish to say thank you very much for your participation. Alana, thank you. I think Alana may be having some technical difficulties with her audio, um, but I think she wants to point out that all of the resources you used for your teaching session are available on the Learning Resource Center. So that uh, link is shared there and that each session will be recorded and a feedback survey will be sent out to all of the participants after the session. Um, there's also a, a certification of completion. Um, so all of the participants will receive that survey by email. No.
Okay, Alana, we can turn it now. Okay, thank you. I just want to thank the teachers, uh, Dr. Hope, Papicho, and Indaba for an amazing session. Very good teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next week.